Okay. So uh, it really is a pressure today to uh, uh, welcome Eduardo Neri to our Mellestone virtual seminar for April. Um, Eduardo is originally from Southern Brazil, from um, the Florianopolis, the state of uh, in Santa Catarina, where he did his undergrad and master's. At that time, he hadn't seen the light yet, and he was working on Azorella and other APLAs and a lot of morphometrics. But he's now moved to um, the Universidad Federal do ABC, which is uh, one of the federal universities in the suburbs of Sao Paulo, where he's doing his uh, PhD in evolutionary biology. So Eduardo, um, if you ask him if he is a taxonomist, he would say no, but he knows more about plants that he would admit or more about taxonomy that he would admit. Um, but nonetheless, we, we, we're glad to have him here because he's using melastomes for his research. And uh, Eduardo um, is right now here at the New York Botanical Garden on a six month stint. He only has uh, three more weeks left before he goes back to Sao Paulo and about a year before he has to defend this thesis. Um, and uh, he's gonna be talking to us today about the first chapter of his thesis, or mostly his first chapter, there will be other things sprinkled in, on the evolution of ecological specialization and consequences in neotropical systems. No um, uh, melastomataceae in the title, but I think there will be some in the content. Um, so please go ahead, Eduardo, and take it away. Oh. Thank you, Fabian, for your introduction, and thank you all for attending my, my talk. Um, I have to admit, I'm quite nervous, so give me a break if I miss some words or my spelling is not so good. But uh, So my name is Eduardo Kerishneri, or you can call me Edu if you like me or if you want to be friends. And I'm really glad to be on the Melastome seminars for this April talk. Uh, a brief introduction about myself, that, that's ha that handsome guy is me, and this is Brazil, where I came from. As Fabian told us, uh, I came from this southern part of Brazil, uh, more, spe more specifically, Florianópolis or Floripa, uh, where I did my undergrad and master's, and then I moved to Sao Paulo to get my PhD. Uh, I got enrolled in the Universi Universidade Federal do ABC, or UF ABC, uh, in one of the sat satellite cities of Sao Paulo. And today I'm going to uh, talk about my, my thesis, which is entitled, has the same title as, as the talk, The Evolution of Ecological Specialization and Its Consequences in Neurotropical Systems. Uh, I run this project uh, in the Animal Plant Interaction Laboratory at this university under the supervision of Dr. Dr. Anselmo Nogueira. Uh, so specialization is a really common pattern that we can see in nature um, among animals, bacteria, and plants. And when we can see some examples in plants that are really uh, uh, representative like some plants use really specific yields of pollinators, while other plants just grow on some kinds of sub substrates. And other plants need very specific requirements for germination, as fire or uh, some kind of uh, environmental cue. Uh, so, specialization uh, in a broad sense, ecological specialization in a broad sense, is when organisms uh, can use uh, narrower. Uh, range of resource environments or interacting partners compared to other organisms that we call generalists. Uh, so we can recognize this pattern really easily in nature, but we still don't know its consequences through macroevolutionary scale. And in the literature, we can recognize two main hypotheses about uh, the consequences of specialization. One is uh, really famous is the dead, dead end hypothesis that postulate that due to this greater specificity of uh, special, uh, specialists, they have narrow geographic ranges would uh, threaten them to would threaten their survival on the long, on the long, on the long term. 
because of the, the, their adaptation, they can hold genetic constraints that would reduce evolvability. So, what is Oh, is someone asking something, or is just a turned on microphone? Okay. And so, the ultimate uh, result of this hypothesis would be a greater extinction rate. Opposing this hypothesis, we have a red queen based hypothesis. We call it evolutionary runner hypothesis, which postulate that uh, specialists, due their specificity, can evolve faster to their requirements or resources or interacting partners because they spend more time on those resources or partners. Because of that, they experience a greater uh, genetic purge reducing genetic load and increasing evolvability. And the ultimate result of this hypothesis would be greater speciation rates. So uh, no matter what hypothesis you're tr trying to test, specialization can have an impact on biodiversity, either by increasing extinction or increasing speciation. Uh, in really diverse uh, systems, uh, as the Atlantic forests, where, uh, where we have a, a accumulation of, uh, of narrower range uh, species. We already have great knowledge about historical process and other ecological process uh, impacting biodiversity. But we still don't know what are the impacts of, of specialization on plant biodiversity on this really diverse, diverse uh, ecosystems or uh, domains because the literature is mainly tempered bias. Uh, so my thesis tried to answer three different uh, questions, uh, or six if we split it, uh, that were the impacts of specialization on tropical systems. In the first chapter, I tried to uh, assess where special specialization can thrive and whether it can uh, reduce ge geographic range or not. In the second chapter, uh, I want to see the impact of specialization on plant strategy and if it can constrain functional uh, traits or uh, does or, but so by this mean reducing evolvability. In the third chapter, I will address the the ultimate uh, result of specialization, if it can change speciation or extinction rates, and if it change also the mode of speciation in tropical systems. Um, so during this talk, I'm gonna mainly address the first chapter that is already revealed and uh, submitted. Uh, I have data and some charts and uh, ideas for the second and third chapter that I would be willing to discuss if you guys want, but um, we're going to talk about that afterwards. So the first chapter is the evolution of ecological specialization or lies plant endemism in the Atlantic forest. So we know from the literature, there is uh, this general pattern that specialization leads to uh, narrow geographic ranges or smaller geographic ranges because specialists have fewer options uh, to use uh, on the landscape. So if we have this pattern of ge restricted geogra geographic range repeated over time on the same area, we can reach endemis, which is this geographic pattern of narrowly range organisms uh, coexisting in an area. But how can we have uh, specialization and geographic, narrow geographic ranges accumulating in the area? One hypothesis uh, uh, presumes that environmental heterogeneity can impose selective pressures upon organisms or upon organisms and lead them to greater specialization. Um, so we're going to have like um, a small thought experiment here. Let's say we have two landscapes, one more homogeneous and more, one more heterogeneous, where each square is in a possible environment and where similar colors uh, represent similar environments. So here we have a more homogeneous landscape and here a more heterogeneous he landscape. And let's say we are talking about this non-optimized organism where each dot represents a population, okay? And he's equally spread on both landscapes. Uh, 
in the first landscape, the more homogeneous ones, a uh, difference among environments are not so big. So gene flow can be maintained among populations. But on the second uh, landscape, uh, there are some huge differences among environments that can seize the gene flow, right? Uh, and throughout time and generations on the second late scale, we can have two main results, or the non-optimized phenotype can be optimized to their environment, become locally adapted, or it can be locally extinct because it lacks genetic uh, diversity to extend that environment. So throughout the micro, micro evolutionary scale, we're going to have uh, more generalist widespread species on the uh, more homogeneous landscape and more specialized narrow range uh, organisms in the more heterogeneous landscape. Uh, the authentic forest is a knowledge biodiverse uh, hotspot. Uh, it's a mostly mountain domain ranging from sea level to almost 3,000 meters. And it's analogically uh, heterogeneous, uh, encompassing different kinds of environment. And most of its flora is endemic. Uh, about 63% of the plant species that are in the Atlantic forest are endemic to this domain. And the most diverse genus in this domain is Myconia. Okay. So that's why I'm using the Myconia during my project. And Myconia are really cool. I mean, we could talk about the, this genus for a long time, but the main thing, like we have like this uh, prediction or assumption that Myconia have high dispersion potential because they have this tiny berry fruits that are eaten by a, a variety of vertebrates, mostly birds. But despite this high dispersion potential, there is a lot of endemis of Myconia in the Atlantic forests. So this pose some range limit factor acting upon these lineages in the Atlantic forest. So in this chapter, we propose that uh, species uh, are facing greater environmental heterogeneity in the Atlantic forests and are being selected towards greater specialization which in turn reduce the species range size, promoting endemism in the Atlantic forest. Uh, so for this hypothesis, we predicted that endemic species should find greater environmental heterogeneity in the Atlantic forests uh, than non-endemic species in other domains. Endemic species should be more specialized than non-endemic species in other domains. And specialization among this endemic species should result from a selection-driven scenario rather than a purely neutral evolutionary scenario. And finally, we predict that small geographic ranges should be associated or color correlated with specialization rather than to historical process that can also constrain uh, range size, like the Pleistocene refugia that we have um, quite evidence that have been acting on the Atlantic forest during the Pleistocene. So for this chapter, I have used four environmental fossil layers representing relevant conditions to Myconia based on the literature. And we work on a resolution of five by five kilometer grid cells, which is approximately the Batanish scale sense of arc rate. So we are not talking about environmental variation inside communities, guys. We are talking about uh, environmental variation that experienced by whole lineages, whole species, okay? Uh, for this chapter, I've used this uh, super section of Myconia as city system, the Myconia super this colors, which includes 66 species. Um, and based on their occurrences uh, uh, regarding the athletic forest, we could classify them as AF endemic, AF non endemic that occur in the Atlantic forest and other domains and all 24 other species that do not occur in the Atlantic forest, but are spread over other uh, neotropical domains. Uh, we also use molecular phylogenies for this group, a, a random sample of 100 trees, and a data set, a taxonomically curated data set of the species occurrences. So our first goal objective was to estimate environmental heterogeneity faced by species. Uh, to do this, we use Hall's Q index, 
which given a focal site like this one, we compare the focal site with the neighbor sites, and we can average this, this similarity from the focal site to the neighbor sites and get the Q value. So the higher the Q value, the higher the environmental heterogeneity around the site. So we apply the Q index to species occurrences. And what we got was this. Uh, we use the medians because means are really prone to outliers. Okay. So this is the median Q value for each species. And they are sorted by group. And endemic species, mm, uh, species that are not endemic but are still in the Atlantic forest and species that are outside the Atlantic forest. And what we see is that in average, uh, endemic species face from 40 to 80 for 85% more heterogeneity than their counterparts uh, that are not endemic or in other uh, uh, neotropical domains. Later, uh, uh, this environmental heterogeneity is mostly related to the mountain landscapes in the Atlantic forest. Okay, they can shift uh, different environmental grad gradients from south to north, and also from the coast to the, main, uh, to the mainland. Uh, the second goal was to estimate specialization among species. And to do that, we apply the hypervolume model, which is kernel density estimates over different variables. So given that we are working on some environmental variables that we can represent as axes, we can plot the known uh, values from occurrences and then project the unknown uh, space that they can occupy on this environmental axis based on this hypervolume module. So volumes or models with uh, smaller hypervolume size indicate greater specialization. Okay. We apply these hypervolume models to species occurrences um, to estimate the degree of specialization. And what we got was that, that on average, uh, this is the hypervolume size on the y-axis. And those are the different three classes of geographic distribution, endemic species, uh, species that are in Atlantic forest, but are not endemic, and species that are outside of the Atlantic forest. And what I have seen is that uh, endemic species are on average from 30 to 100% more specialized than their relatives of, uh, that are not endemic or that are outside of the Atlantic forest. So endemic species are more specialized than non-endemic species. This pattern has been seen in other scales, but not in the macro evolutionary scale. Uh, this uh, paper by Mariano was comparing different uh, plant communities across gradient, uh, different gradients, mountain gradients, and those communities are were separate just by 20, 100 meters, uh, by, just by 20, 200 meters. And we see a, a high tur species turner of, uh, among these communities, indicating that the species there inhabit one community usually are not inhabited a neighbor community, which is a sign of specialization. We also have seen this pattern on this uh, work by the Paula that had classified species on functional groups and see also a big turnover along environment, uh, mountain gradients on the Atlantic forest. Uh, the third goal of this chapter was to infer the likely evolutionary scenario of specialization. To this goal, we have used 100 phylogenetic trees for our study system. We, throughout all the trees, we re, uh, reconstruct uh, ancestral uh, uh, areas using DEC. And later, we try to fit different evolutionary models uh, based on the Akai criterion. And we consider two families of uh, evolutionary models. Those based on Brownian motion that mainly represent neutral evolution. And then those models uh, using austin Uhlenbach O models that represent selection driven evolution and evolutionary constraints. Uh, this is what, just one tree uh, with one reconstruction. Okay. Uh, the, the, here we have time before the present. Uh, the, Blue dots represent endemic species. Uh, and what we see is that endemism 
in the Atlantic forest had evolved at least three times in average along all the phylogenies. Uh, and them is mostly is prior to the Pleistocene. Uh, and throughout all this uh, phylogenetic trees, OMV model had the best fit. This model uh, assumes non-neutral evolution and is based on two parameters. The first parameter we call theta, theta which is kind of the optimum or evolutionary optimum for uh, each group. So this uh, model assumes that there are different evolutionary optimums for the groups. And what we see is that theta values for endemic species are way smaller than theta values for non-endemic and other lineages in other domains. So what we can conclude is that is endemic species are evolving towards a more specialized optimum in the Atlantic forest. The second important parameter is sigma, which represents the amount of variation or how uh, this species can vary around this optimum. And what we see is that uh, endemic species are not allowed to evolve away from the optimum uh, as much as non-endemic species or lineages that are not associated with the Atlantic forest. Uh, and this is a sign that some sort of evolutionary constraint can be acting upon endemic species. And to check uh, whether it is, that was really deviating from neutral evolution, we conduct uh, some, some simulations across, across trees. And we got this result where we have the mean hypervolume size on the x axis. Um, the grade distribution represents the neutral expectation for hypervolume. And uh, the lines here represent the observed mean value for those groups. And what we can see that is non endemic species and species associated to other neotropical domains kind of fill the kind of fit the, the neutral evolution, but endemic species depart from this neutral evolution. So uh, there is a deviation of, uh, from neutral evolution, which uh, points out to selection. And this selection is acting mostly on endemic species. Uh, so the third uh, goal, we can answer like uh, specialization among endemic species results from a selection regime imposing evolutionary constraints. And this relates to our main hypothesis uh, that mountain landscapes can be imposed greater environmental heterogeneity to these lineages, which increase selective pressures, uh, divergent, divergent selective pressures, and uh, favors the specialization in the Atlantic forest. Lastly, we try to infer the correlates of smaller geographic ranges among uh, endemic species. Uh, to do that, we repeated the process of uh, fitting evolutionary models, but this time we fitted evolutionary models to range size instead of uh, niche breadth for specialization. And what you got is that this is a time-related reconstruction based on the 100 phylogenetic trees. Uh, we see that this decay of geogra geographic range in the past uh, on the on lineages that are not related to the Atlantic forest, uh, but we don't see any decrease of geographic range during the Pleistocene where forest refugia would be acting. And so we could not address, uh, we could not assign small geographic ranges to the forest refugia acting on the place to see. We should not uh, also like overinterpret this uh, values um, deep in the notes because there is a lot of uncertainty, but we can interpret the uh, more recent values here in the place to see. So small. Uh, small geographic ranges uh, do not correlate with the uh, place to scene where forest refugia would be acting and constraining geographic range. But when we look to hypervolume size or special or degree specialization uh, with regard to range size, uh, what we see is that uh, there is a closer fit between 
hypervalent size and range size among endemic species. But this fit is really poor on species that are not endemic or that are not associated to Atlantic forests here in red. So there is association uh, between small range sizes and greater specialization, but just among endemic species, not outside the Atlantic forests. So uh, specialization likely has lead to small range sizes in the Atlantic forest, but small range sizes may result from other process in the other domains, like the Amazonia and Cerrado. So the take home message from this talk was endemic species face greater environmental heterogeneity in the Atlantic forest. The endemic species are in general more specialized than their non-endemic uh, relatives. Specialization among endemic species uh, mostly likely resulted from a selection driven uh, evolutionary scenario, also imposing evolutionary constraints. And small range of sizes uh, better correlate with specialization in the Atlantic forest, but do not correlate it uh, in, in other lineages that are outside of this domain. Uh, this work was financed or supported by my university, with, which granted me a post uh, PhD scholarship by Papespe, which supports our laboratory, and by CAPES for the PDS, PDSE scholarship that sent me to New York. Uh, those are the other three topics that I would like to discuss if you guys are willing. But that's it. Thank you for your attention and time. And I hope you guys all enjoy it. Thank you, Edu. Um, very interesting. Uh, so I'm opening this up now. Do anybody, it, you, you can just uh, unmute yourself if you have any questions um, and then uh, we can start. Um, I can start with the first question and, and you know, Go ahead. we have discussed some of this already and, and tough, so I, I, most other people should, should jump in first. But one of the things um, looking at the maps and all that is when, when you have lots of, what you're calling endemics do you have a lot of them on top of each other or they are in different spots are they sympatric or are they all in different areas and then also when you get to add there when you talk about heterogeneity being important for endemic species is that because that uh, uh, makes each of those environments more isolated from each other so i guess it's two questions yeah two questions but they are related uh, so first, uh, the geographic sign among endemic species I'm addressing in the third chapter. And what we see is that without considering time of divergence, the degree of sympathy among endemic species is the same as non-endemic species. But when you put time, because endemic species uh, diverged recently, they are more proportionally more sympatric than non-endemic species. So for the amount of time they had to diverge, they are still really close. Okay. And second question was if the environmental heterogeneity also could isolate the, the populations and so on the lineage. Yeah, this is hard to disentangle because Yes, it can, and, uh, and that's one of the assumptions of the model, like if you have a really different matrix to try to cross, it's hard to cross. So you keep in the spot that you are. Thank you. Uh, other comments, questions, complaints? Yes, I have questions. <laughs> oh. um, so, so cool. Thank you for your talk. It's amazing to see this combination of methods used in a milestone group. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing very similar things in Mariani with the ones that went to the Andes and those that did not about like niche breadth and range size. So it's really cool to see that from two different systems. And I was wondering um, about the plots that you showed for range size 
through time, basically. Um, where you see that during the Pleistocene, basically all of those had very small range sizes. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are and whether smaller range sizes in the Atlantic forest are actually related to the Atlantic forest, or maybe, um, you know, more driven by the time when these species evolved. Um, yeah, I I've, I've, I get the feeling that some of the patterns that we see that are related to mountains uh, very much relate to the timing when species actually colonized certain habitats or lineages colonized habitats. So maybe you have some thoughts on that. Yes, uh, since the mountains and the Atlantic forests are way older than the system, the mountains were already there to be colonized when this lineage approached the Atlantic forest. So let's say. Here is the first colonization. Uh, here is the first colonization attempt when we have species that are not endemic but are also in the Atlantic forest. And when they colonize the Atlantic forest, they are already small ranged compared to lineages that are outside the Atlantic forest where they derive it from. So the colonization of Atlantic forests forces small ranges from my perspective, but not the place to see because there is no like decrease or increase on the overall range size during the Pleistocene, okay? So small range sizes are prior to the Pleistocene are, and are most related to the colonization of these mountain landscapes. And the same happens with the endemic species that are only inhabit these mountain landscapes. So uh, did I answer your question or not? Yes, you did, you did. Yes. And, uh... From your results and what you know about the group now, would you say or would you be able to point towards certain, say, pre-adaptation speedum in the environmental niche or vegetative traits or flora traits that would have enabled the species to actually specialize more and become endemic? Or yeah, yeah. that's that's the second chapter. I okay, will not cool. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I next have... talk. <laughs> <laughs> next talk or my my thesis defense. So I mm. have a data set of functional traits for those uh, plants, and I'm until analyzing. And what I have seen that there is a change of plant strategy, like uh, an overall change of plant strategy um, in endemic species, uh, and they are more related with twelve fast uh, light seeking uh, or light harvesting uh, strategy, while other uh, species are more uh, related to light demanding and slow pace growth strategy. So there is a change on functional traits. Um, and I still don't know if this change is prior to the colonization or happens after the colonization. I didn't contrast the timing of these changes with the geographic shift. So I don't know if they are pre-adaptations or adaptations. Yeah, sounds great. I'm excited to see that. <laughs> and the same with prerequisites or con consequences, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And the same with the floral traits. Uh, what we see is like endemic species that just have the Atlantic forest uh, have like a self and syndrome like flowers, uh, while the non endemic or uh, species spread over other tropical domains uh, have uh, don't don't have this syndrome. They have more like more heterentery, uh, uh, greater hercogamy, uh, greater flowers. Myconians have small flowers, but on the Myconian scale, uh, they have bigger flowers outside the Atlantic forest, which might be related to uh, overall short uh, pollen, pollinator, pollination shortage uh, on these mountain landscapes. But we don't have data on each specific species to infer if they are they're experience pollination shortage, but we know that Atlantic forest overall imposes this uh, problem to plants. Cool, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Eduardo, uh, 
Fernando Silveira makes a question here on the on the chat. Maybe he's too shy to to talk. Okay, um, Fernando. <laughs> if he does, well, I uh, okay. I'm gonna read. I can it. read it. I can read it for everyone. I'm not wearing a shirt, so I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's it's too hot for Lale. Okay, so. <laughs> So Fernando says that uh, there is a large potential for seed dispersal in Myconia because they're all berries. Although most of species are dispersed by birds, not all birds have the same dispersal effectiveness. And also there can be monkeys, bat, non-volant mammals, reptiles, ants, etc. Mm -hmm. that can disperse Myconia seeds. So Lele is wondering whether you have looked at the fruit traits and associated dispersers that could drive changes in distribution range for some um, species? So I have the fruit data and seed data. Uh, and what I see is that there are more investment on each seed in the endemic species. They have fewer seeds and heavier seeds compared to the non-endemic and widespread species on other tropical domains. Uh, and we know that those but these heavier seeds likely don't change the dispersal range for the dispersers, like the same, the same size, you know, the fruits are kind of the same size, just the, the carbon allocation sh changes. And from that, what I can assume is like, if you have heavier seeds and fewer seeds, you're investing more on each of your, sub, each of your kids, because you wanna use than to persist in that spot because you don't have that many spots to try to spread your offspring. So I think this is a response to the specialization to maintain habitats. Yeah, but, also, but bigger seeds imply more resources for each one seed to ensure more survival. Yes, so they can stand more time and wait for suitable conditions in their preferred or required uh, environment. That's what I have seen in the seeds so far. So re related to that, Renato asked uh, about ap apomixis. It's been shown that apomixis species in Myconi tend to have more, are more widespread than non-apomixis species. And we have, a, fortunately, we have a lot more data for Atlantic forest than we do for Andean species on, on whether on, uh, they are on the system. or not. Um, um, yes. So actually, and Vini um, it, it adds to the apomixis asking about ploidy level. I don't know if you have the data for that. The ploidy level, not. <laughs> <laughs> but the apomixis, for sure. But it's also, again, kind of similar to the Agnes question, the egg and the chicken. Uh, it can be a pre-adaptation, like enabling range, range size to expand or can be a response uh, to pollination shortage, for, uh, for instance. But from what I know from Iconia, that those apomitic tend to be also a polyploid that kind of are related to hybridization or some sort of abnormal chromosome phenomena. Uh, so I guess apomixes in Myconia are a response to stabilize or to, uh, uh, to counter the wrong meiotic division from polyploid. While this uh, selfing syndrome that we are seeing in the Atlantic forest is more related to pollination shortage. But both of them would allow greater uh, pollination independence, independence, which is kind of weird because in the endemic, they have they have this independence because they are more selfing, but they are not spreading. So something beyond pollination is holding geographic expansion because they have the reproductive traits to expand. They are selfing. They should be able to expand because they are not relying that much on pollinators. But the apomitic ones are spreading. Well, but this, this does make a lot of sense. Uh, if you think of for apomictic species, you have this um, 
what is it called, the frozen niche variation model, where you assume that certain genotypes that reproduce apomictically get frozen and thus genetic diversity may be maintained in a population and they may react to different climatic conditions and thus the species as a whole may appear more generalized. Mm -hmm. Whereas in uh, um, selfing species, they may just be very inbred um, and thus be stuck in their one site. Yes, I, I have conducted a, a few preliminary analyses based on coalescent models. And what we see is that uh, endemic lineages tend to coalesce really fast, indicating that there is no much genetic diversity inside the lineages, while the widespread ones tend to coalesce and uh, deeper in time. Uh, indicating that either uh, mutation rates are higher or population sizes are, uh, are bigger. So there's some sign of inbreeding in the Atlantic forest uh, if we consider coalescent time as a proxy. So cool, you're doing awesome work. <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you. Uh, and Marcelo, is your question kind of answer or or not? I don't know. I don't. I didn't uh, see that question. Who else has a question? I, I don't know who, who you said, Marcelo. I don't see Marcelo's question. No, no question for okay. Me. Okay. That that was yeah. Thank you. So uh, Agnes is saying that we need uh, more chromosome counts. Yes. But yeah. I can tell you, they are hard. They are very hard to get. Um, they, I bet. <laughs> yeah, chrom chromosomes and melosomes are tiny. But uh, th there is, uh, in, in the own uh, soon to come out book on melosomes, uh, Frank Almeida and Darren Pennies have a, a chapter on chromosome evolution, and they are reporting a lot more counts and are, are already in the literature. So it's starting to get, starting to get populated. and, and there is actually a, a strong correlation between apomixis and anoploidy, meaning you know, this, this counts that tend to deviate by one or two from, from, the, from the base number. But there are a few things going in there. So uh, yeah. Um, any other questions? I have a comment. Yes, go ahead. Slash question. Hey. It's, always, it's always like that. <laughs> nice work. Yeah. Um, my my comments is related to the extinction and diversification rates. Just because, of course, you're dealing with current existing species, right? So when you're like constructing the ancestral uh, range size, you said that the Pleistocene, and I can see here in the in the in your slide that doesn't change anything, and it could be maybe because you're dealing with like lineages that were more stable in the past. And maybe the Pleistocene somehow uh, made lineages extinct and stuff like that. So can you can you access like extinction and diversification rates comparing like endemic lineages and not endemic lineages, something like that? I'm gonna make it, I'm, I'm trying to do this uh, in the third chapter where I try to compare uh, those rates not so much extinction because trying mm -hmm. to infer extinction is like I was a headache, uh, but mostly speciation um, related to specialization. And what we have seen is like specialization has a saying on extinction rates. Uh, but also there's an interplaying with the uh, geographic shift. There's always uh, there's also an increase by changing from the other lowland domains to the upper mountain domains in the Atlantic forest. So there's an interplay between ecological specialization, increasing speciation rates, and also this shift. Okay, extinction. I will not like uh, talk about that much and um, overly interpreted those extinction rates because you know they are they have a, like they are plagued with a very difficult statistical issues 
so from what I've seen, there is no change on extinction. All right. Okay. Yeah. But it's like, it's always this, uh, it's hard to tell because it's hard to infer extinction rates mm -hmm. from just leaving things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, don't be shy, guys. Otherwise, I'll be like here. I have oh. another question that I can ask. <laughs> yes, sure. Um, I, for I forgot, maybe it's very quickly answered. Do you have multiple colonization events of the Atlantic rainforest in your, or is it just one clay that went there? On average, three. Three, okay. On average, three along the different phylogen phylogenies that I have used, yes. Okay, that is awesome. Because in, in Mariani, I'm now dealing with the, with a really bad Darwin scenario where you basically have one clade that went to the Andes and they went crazy and nothing else. So I'm really wondering about how many went extinct, the sort yes. of maybe colonized, but then did not have the traits or pre adaptations that made it possible and went extinct. And that's the good thing about uh, Myconi in general, because we have different radiations or this different events of colonization. We have the super section. We also have Leandra, and also we have a third clade, Kianantera. Uh, so it would be really nice to compare the, these three endemic radiations if they, they have the same pattern. If it repeats throughout those radiations, it's something related to the, to the main instead of with the specific clade that is colonizing. So I guess it's not happening the same in the Andes, right? You have fewer radiations in the Andes. Yeah, at least in Mariani. Oh, but I mean, that sounds great. You should, you should go for it. Yes, <laughs> eventually I will do it. <laughs> I cannot hear if I can. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, if it, there are uh, any more co questions, comments for Edu. Well, this is great. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Edu. Very educational, very, very nice. I don't know why you were very nervous. Yeah, uh, I was. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll we'll keep talking. We'll invite you to talk about chapters two and three when those come out. Uh, Edu mentioned it, but uh, I will uh, reiterate it here. So that chapter one has already been submitted and is in revision. And the phylogeny of section uh, discolores or supersection discolores that he mentioned earlier uh, just came out on, as um, uh, pre proofs in uh, molecular systematic uh, phylogenetics and evolution, sorry, this week. Uh, and, and we got uh, proofs this, this week too. So they, the final paper should come out in the next week or so. Um, Thank you very much, Edu, and we'll see you guys uh, next month. It's not going to be at the beginning of the month. It's going to be in the middle of the month. It's going to be Darren Penny's talking about um, uh, family-wide phylogeny, and um, we'll we'll see you in about five weeks. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.